Ready? Okay. Um, all right. Just a reminder that our, uh, our uh, session tonight is being recorded. And um, I've uh, got a microphone that we can use and pass it around, as well as the mic that I have here for our presentation. And I look forward to your participation and responses. We're going to be looking at the rest of Leviticus tonight. So we'll be looking from, uh, we left off at chapter 13, I believe it was. So we'll be working our way from 14 to 27 tonight, okay? All right, and as soon as Mike gets uh, settled, we'll, we'll go ahead and begin. I struggled with this. Uh, this was a difficult, uh, very difficult read for me. Not that the words were difficult, it was hard to hear them <laughs> as I was reading them. And uh, they're speaking uh, not only to the people of, of um, the time of the Israelites, but also to us as well. And I think it's important to understand that. All right. So <clears throat> uh, we'll begin in prayer. And as I said, I've written this prayer specifically for this particular lesson uh, because of my own personal struggle with it. And um, as I was reading through the materials, uh, I noticed that they made a number of references to Christ that doesn't appear in the text. But I think what they're saying is what Christ has done for us relates to his accomplishment, his completion of the law that we see here. So we'll see how that works out, okay? Uh, so in uh, prayer, we'll begin. Dear Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we encounter you in our study this evening as the severe and demanding judge of the old covenant law that you made with your people in the Sinai Desert. Let us also meditate on the new covenant that you made with your people in the person of your Son, Jesus Christ, at Calvary. There in the Sinai, your glory was unapproachable, your yoke heavy, your words hard. In your Son, our Savior, you showed us a better way, a lighter yoke, more comforting words through Jesus', Jesus sacrifice on the cross. Your new law was to love. Love you and love one another. Open our eyes and hearts to see you as our God of steadfast love in the words of Leviticus and the Psalms. Our sacrifices to you today are our love and faithfulness reaching up to kiss your righteousness and mercy. We pray for your continuous presence among us. In Jesus' name, amen. That was hard for me to write. I, 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 I meditated on that one quite a while. Uh, the point is, they are hard words. They are difficult. There's a lot of, lot of law, a lot of law here. And um, it's kind of hard to see the gospel directly in the law, as I said, except as we see uh, Christ as the fulfillment of that law, the perfect fulfillment of the law. So, beginning, hi, uh, beginning with our um, March, uh, excuse me, our 815, sorry, it says March 4th, 815, 22. Last week's, we talked about uh, clean and unclean. Uh, we talked about uh, uh, both people and animals that were clean and unclean. Uh, we talked about um, humans and how they were, from time to time, clean and unclean, uh, regard, regarding particularly the laws uh, of leprosy. And uh, there were clarifications in some of the notes indicating that we don't know if this is real leprosy or not, but it seems to be a number, a variety of diseases of the skin that were all kind of classed under the rubric leprosy. Uh, but none of, nonetheless, each one of those created a kind of blemish. Now, that's an interesting word because we're going to, we've already encountered it 
Uh, in fact, when we hear about the, the sacrifices that were made, uh, they required an unblemished animal. For example, a lamb or a goat or, or some other, uh, even a turtle dove or what have you. Uh, they were to be unblemished when they were sacrificed. So that word blemish is interesting because it is here also connected with the human as well. Um, so that was what we had covered in our introduction last week. And then we, he, we've gone on to Leviticus 14 and 15. And there we had a continuation of the laws concerning lepers, how they were supposed to present themselves in order to be identified as uh, clean or unclean, the cleansing of the lepers, that is, as it's called in my text. And um, we also uh, uh, we also had uh, this issue. Uh, oops, sorry, thirteen or fourteen? Yeah, uh, fourteen and fifteen. Yeah, the the fourteen and fifteen. Then we had, and this was hard, <laughs> and gruesome. I'm not a medical guy. I don't have any interest in medicine. But reading about bodily discharges kind of uh, <laughs> it kind of kept me moving quickly through the text. Um, but, there, the, but these things as well cause people to be clean or unclean. That's in chapter 15. Then in chapters 16, in chapter 16, we have the Day of Atonement. Now, it's interesting that I have seen, and you probably have as well, there are several times in the scripture here, in, in Leviticus itself, where they talk about the Day of Atonement, uh, maybe from slightly different perspectives, uh, but it, it's, it's an important uh, day, not of feasting, and that's an interesting concept. We have all these feast days, the first fruits and all of that. Here, it's a fasting day. And in fact, the term that is used when they are talking about the Day of Atonement is that uh, a person was expected to be... Um, Afflicted, and I, I think that comes out more in 16 than in, yeah, in 16 with the Day of Atonement. Uh, we talk, it talks about, it uses the word in my text, uh, afflicted. They need to afflict themselves. And um, so it's, it's an interesting um, thing there. Also, there was a reference, and I, I had to look up some of these um, uh, terms. There's a reference to the high priest changing his clothing so that instead of all the elaborate garments that he was to wear on any other day of sacrifice in the Holy of Holies, uh, he would not wear that on the Day of Atonement. Instead, he wore a garment of all linen. Now, what's interesting about that particular thing is uh, we were referred to of various um, passages in Isaiah, in John, Gospel of John, and in Philippians about that, that garment. Um, now, in the, in the most specific re re uh, reference to garments is in John 13, where it says that Jesus laid aside his outer garments tied a towel around his waist and washed the feet of his disciples. So he was basically stripped down himself into something very simple and the intention was to be a servant to his own disciples by washing their feet. And then in Isaiah, uh, it uses that word afflicted. And... Um, in Isaiah 53, verses 1 through 5, it speaks of uh, the, the one to come being stricken, smitten, and afflicted. And by his stripes, the, the, the thing, the, 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 the uh, whipping that he got, by his stripes we are healed. So that's kind of an interesting word. Um, and then finally in Philippians, we have... Uh, the statement by Paul that Jesus made himself nothing being obedient even to death. So he's reduced himself from 
what he came as, the king, and now he is the sacrificial lamb. And that, that struck me. Now, about fli- afflicted, uh, in, again, in my notes in, in, the, in my Bible, I found out that afflicted included fasting. And in the guide that we have, it talks about uh, six, fe- seven festivals and one fasting. And I have those listed in another passage coming at us. But I just wanted to raise that issue now because that idea of being afflicted is related to the fast. And the, the, uh, um, uh, the Day of Atonement was a fast. Okay. All right. Then moving on to Leviticus 17 and, uh, through 19. Wow. These were difficult uh, uh, chapters. Um, there was one long one. I mean, I can't believe how many different ways you can uncover someone's nakedness. But all of, the, all of the restrictions on nakedness. Now, I have, I, I've made some inferences, drawn some inferences from that, because there seems to be, when in that whole chapter, let me see, was it 17? Um, oh, no, it was 18, unlawful sexual relations. Well, let me go to 17 first, because I found that interesting. Um, there is the first time that I've ac- actually seen a reference to uh, the word whore. We've heard of prostitutes, right? But here he makes, um, if, if this is indeed bo- Moses' book, he speaks specifically to the issue of chasing other gods. He calls that being a whore. And I would like to read this to you. This is interesting. Um, the place of sacrifice. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons and to all the people of Israel and say to them, This is the thing that the Lord has commanded. If, one, uh, if anyone of the house of Israel kills an ox or a lamb or a goat in the camp or kills it outside the camp it does, and does not bring it to the entrance of the tents of meeting, meeting uh, to offer it as a gift to the Lord in front of the temple of the Lord, Blood guilt shall be imputed to that man. So that's interesting. In other words, when you are slaughtering an animal for the purpose of sacrifice, you're supposed to be slaughtering it right there at the tabernacle, not out in the field somewhere. But if you do kill one, an animal out there, then you are required to bring it to the the tabernacle. If you don't, you're guilty of that animal's blood. He has shed blood, and that man shall be cut off from his people. This is to the end that the people of Israel may bring their sacrifices that they sacrifice in the open field, and that they may bring them to the Lord, to the priest at the entrance of the tent of meeting, and sacrifice as sacrifices of peace offerings to the Lord. And the priest shall throw the blood on the altar, of the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting and burn it uh, and burn fat for the pleasing aroma of the Lord. So they shall no more sacrifice their sacrifices to goat demons. Idolatry. To goat demons that uh, after whom they whore. Wow. Strong words. This shall be a statute forever for them throughout their generations. Most of the laws are accompanied by that statement. After the law is stated, then they say this will be a permanent statute for all generations. Statute, sorry. A permanent statute for all generations. And you shall say to them, any, uh, any one of the house of Israel or strangers who sojourn among them who offers a burnt offering or sacrifice and does not bring it to the tent of meeting, that man shall be cut off from his people. So you're going to be in exile. You're literally going to lose your, your status as an Israelite by doing just that. And I found that there were other uh, references as well to the concept of whoring, as they call it. Uh, especially when you are pursuing idolatry. You're pursuing idols, okay? And then, as I said, 
chapter 18. Wow. As I said, it's really, it's loaded with all the things you can't do with a close family member. And they all have to do with the expression, um, uncover a relative's nakedness. Now, when it says that the, this chapter, at the heading in my, my book, in my Bible, it says unlawful sexual relationships. So the only inference I can draw from that is that when you uncover someone's nakedness, in a sense, you must be having some sort of sexual relationship with them. At least that's the impression that I get. You might get a different one. Um, but it's repeated time and time and time again. And it has to do with uh, women who are uh, of close relations to you. Uh, and also, um, there, of course, is the problem of homosexuality. And that is mentioned here uh, several times. Um, but it starts out with this uncovering a person's nakedness. For example, you shall not, this is verse 19, you shall not approach a woman to uncover her nakedness while she's in her menstrual uncleanness. And you shall not lie sexually with a neighbor's wife and so make yourself unclean with her. Now, what's interesting about references like that with one's neighbor's wife, that's obviously adultery, right? But it doesn't say there what the penalty is for it. It does say it later. And the penalty is death for both parties, the adulterer and the adulteress. So that's kind of, kind of interesting. And then, of course, there are the sexual perversions, uh, what are called abominations. And those, too, are punishable by death. So almost everything you see in these passages has to do with a death penalty of some kind. You remember... Prior to this, when we were reading in Leviticus, it says if you did something unintentionally, uh, that you would give a sacrifice for it, and it, you would be atoned, <coughs> you would receive atonement uh, by the priest. Here, these are all in very intentional, uh, both uh, uh, trespasses against the law and defilement of one's body. And as a result of that, uh, the penalty is death. It's, it's a tough one. Um, but uh, notice that goes through there. <clears throat> and then in chapter 19, here's where we get a list of the, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, get a list of the penalties. And uh, it's almost like a rewriting of the Ten Commandments, and it actually expands on the Ten Commandments or gives more detailed information about what that commandment means and what violating it would mean. And many times, the violations of those are penalized by death. Take just one. Um, that is, let me see if it's in the same chapter. It might be one, a later chapter. Um, yeah, I think it's a later chapter. I think it's mentioned a couple of times. Um, but it goes like this. If you blaspheme, this isn't just using the Lord's name in vain, but you're blaspheming God, you're damning God, okay? In that case, the penalty is death. And uh, that's a tough one. Uh, and the interesting manner of death is by stoning, but before you stone someone who has blasphemed and been witnessed as blaspheming, all the people that are going to stone the person puts their hands on his head. Then they stone him. Wow. That's a difficult thing. That's a tough ritual. Tough. Okay. So, uh, we see this requirement to keep the statutes completely and that there are a number of violations of those statutes <coughs> that can end in your death. Um, another thing, another is, uh, and it gets into your um, eye for an eye thing, and that is when you kill somebody. Remember we had in our sermon this past week uh, the cities of refuge in, in the new, in the new um, 
new, new what can I call it, the promised land uh, of the Israelites. Before that happens, right here it states, not just to murder him, if you kill a man, your life will be required of as payment, eye for an eye. That's interesting, because it doesn't speak of anything about intentionality or non-intentional. It's if you kill somebody, then you're going to be executed. Uh, and we see that kind of reworked uh, when we get when they get into the promised land. But out here, it's just left hanging. You know. I've read some different things. Go ahead. The reason for the eye for an eye. Yeah. For the truth is to keep things in proportion. Sure, of course, of course. People, if somebody injures somebody, you couldn't go kill him for injuring. Him. Right, but if you if he kills. But now I did read several. There was some discussion among the on this blog among the scholars about. Mm -hmm. Whether unintentional or intentional. Correct. They, they, there was some that said that intentional was murder. Correct. Which was different than accidentally killing somebody. Again, I, I agree. You know, and and there was there. there uh, somebody's ox cart got loose and ran over somebody. Exactly. But I'll just read this to yeah, you, okay? No, no, I know. It's, it's the, just interesting to read these different people. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I, again, I think, uh, to to be honest with you, I I think as we progress through different time periods, also, uh, we see a slight change in the way these things are enforced. But to speak just to the eye for an eye, this that's in chapter 24. See, at the end of 24, it says, "Whoever takes a human life shall surely be." Put to death. Straightforward. Whoever takes a human life shall surely be put to death. There's no, no modification to that. <laughs> it says right out. Whoever, and there's your, your, your uh, proportionality here. Uh, whoever takes an animal's life um, shall make it good. Life for life. So if you kill somebody's ox, then you're going to give that person your ox. That sort of thing. Um, any, uh, if anyone injures his neighbor... As he, uh, as he has done, it shall be done to him. Fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Whatever in injury he has given that person shall be given to him. There's your proportionality. Okay? But as I said, it's, it's pretty glaring in that first case what that number one thing is. If you kill somebody, doesn't ask whether you killed them intentionally, doesn't ask whether you did it on purpose. It just says you killed them. Boom. You're surely going to die. So I found that to be, you know, quite, quite difficult. And, oh, there's that other one about the blasphemy. They tell the story of the blasphemy also in chapter 25. And it says um, the, uh, there was an Israelite woman who was married to an Egyptian. I found this interesting because I've never heard it set, spoken of so specifically. Uh, let's see, chapter 24. Now, an Israelite woman's son, this is chapter 24, verse 10, um, whose father was an Egyptian, went out among the people of Israel, and the Israelite woman's son and a man of Israel fought in the camp. And the Israelite woman's son blasphemed the name and cursed. Then they brought him to Moses. His mother's name was uh, Shilomith, the daughter of Debri, of the tribe of Dan. And they put him in custody till the will of the Lord could be clear to them. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Bring out of the camp the one who cursed, and let all who heard him lay their hands on his head, and let all the congregation stone him. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> Pretty well, severe. The reason for that is there's well, what my point was just the, the the specificity of it. The woman's name is given. The right. tribe that her son was from was given. Right. That she was married to an Egyptian was given. Very seldom do you get that kind of detail. Right. That's all. Go ahead. Saying that the reason you know that the people that heard the curse mm -hmm. laid their hands on his head was to transfer what they heard back to him. Correct. Right. There's no question about it. In but fact. The other Mm -hmm. What they said is, um, blaspheme the name, blaspheme the name, curse, forbidden, Exodus 27. 
Yeah. Now, when they blaspheme. Someone severely for their words seem choice by a free speech standard. Right. However, cursing involved more than cussing or a slip of the tongue. Correct. See curse page six. Right. And then see, I'll have to look that up. Yeah, I did. And, oh. and but the point is that the blasphemy has to do with Yahweh. It's not, okay. it's not, because the name is the name you know they'll never use. Um, they use the name as well. Correct. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And he wasn't just cursing the well, guy. That, that kind of changes the specifics, you know. It does. You can curse. <laughs> well, you that's, exactly. Well, that's my point. The one is taking the name in vain. Right. Oh, and the I other know. is is damning God himself. Right. And that is dangerous, obviously. But I was just... <laughs> Also, by the way, to continue your, your point, though, it's a well-made point, Jim. Um, to continue that point, the Day of Atonement, I, I have to go back to that. Uh, on the Day of Atonement, the high priest um, not only sacrifices for the sins of the people, but he also, uh, there is one sacrifice that is made of an animal there, burnt offering, but there's also one where he lays his hands on the head of the animal, transferring the sins of the people to the animal, and then sends it out into the wilderness. Scapegoat. Right. And that, that's an interesting thing, too, because the practice is, is indicative of, of the, in the one case, uh, the sins transferring to the animal, the animal being killed right there, boom, it's done. And the other is escaping, if you will, into the wilderness. But we, we can pretty much understand that that animal is dead. As soon as it steps outside the camp, there's a whole bunch of wild creatures that would love to have them for supper. So it's kind of an interesting thing nonetheless. But yes, the transferring of the sins by laying the hands on the head, yeah, that's a big deal. That's a big deal. Uh, so I'll, I'm already off of my <laughs> schedule. I'm sorry, guys. Yeah, go ahead. Is, is, I think it's kind of a point that, that I see. It doesn't just apply to the Israelites. Right. It applies to anybody. Anybody. Right. And the sojourner among them is a foreigner. Right. Well, the thing to remember is that the God was the first God that was for everybody. Yeah. All other gods before them were for personal God, gods, for personal for gods, particular nations, families, yeah. Not people outside of those groups. Right, exactly. But the, the, our God is for anybody that wants to be a Christian. Yeah. Uh, but go ahead, Jim, Dick. What, what chapter are you working on there? I, I got a point 24? I was thinking on. Go ahead. When you go on to uh, verse thir- or 14. Yeah, let's go there. It goes with your, and 24, 14. Uh-huh, yeah. Take blasphemer outside the camp, and this is where you said about put your hands on them. Mm-hmm. But then he said, in 15, anyone mm-hmm. who curses their God will be held responsible. Sure. Anyone who blasphemes the name of the Lord is to be put to death. Exactly. Now, I also have a reference in Matthew 12, uh-huh. 31, 32, uh-huh. which goes on and says, And so I tell you, every kind of sin and slander that can be forgiven, but blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Exactly. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. Yep. But anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or years to come. Yeah. So it, getting that is up until this point, all these laws only apply to the Israelites. Ah, but but it does say in this particular thing that the the sojourner as well as the native. That's so when it's against yeah. The blasphemy against God. Yeah. 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 Uh, there are, you're right about that too, because most sojourners are protected. Um, they're protected by virtue of being at the home of one of the natives, one of the Israelites. And so even though they were not a family member, they, were, they had a kind of refuge in that house. But as you say here, and this, is, this doesn't happen much, when it says even the sojourner will be put to death, bingo, that's a whole different game. Whole different game, and you know that 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 sin against the Holy Spirit. I mean that you have you, you have voluntarily completely separated yourself from God. Where is your future in that? 
they don't know apparently <laughs> what is not a good future. Um, and um, yeah, yeah, um, I wish people more, more people would understand that, how important that is. Um, but good, I think that's, that's absolutely correct. The other thing that was, was hard for me to take is that child sacrifice. Uh, chapter 20, uh, it says uh, punishment for child sacrifice. And I'll go ahead and read that briefly. Uh, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, say to the people of Israel, any one of the people of Israel or of the strangers, now this is another one, who sojourn um, in Israel, who gives away, this is the second one, by the way, on the sojourners, that gives away his children to Moloch shall surely be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. I myself, and, and this is another expression that I noted, I will set my face against that man. Now that's an interesting expression. I've got another one here that's very much like that but I will set my face against that man and will cut him off from among his people because he has given one of his children to Moloch. To this, my... This is where Mag says... Go ahead. God considered idolatry a spiritual form of spiritual prostitution. Right. That's why he uses the word whore. Yeah, because that's, that's what you're doing. You, you know, you're prostituting yourself to this unclean thing, if you will, but that's yeah, extreme. This is one of the things that throughout my, my studies very, that are very small yeah. compared to a lot of them, because I've just started. Mm -hmm. And th it, it doesn't matter if I'm reading a, reading a Jewish scholar right. or a Christian scholar, mm -hmm. at least most of the ones. Right. Is, as far as they're concerned, taking a life sure. that is not necessary Right. In other words, self-defense right. or, you know, that type of thing. But to kill the, but what they consider particularly uh, an abomination or taking the life of an innocent. Yeah, a child. And abortion. Ch is doing just that. that. I know. I mean, really, I got to read several of these people and they're saying that is absolutely an abomination in God's eyes to even do that, period. I agree. I mean, it doesn't mean the Lord can't forgive. What it means is you better well ask for his forgiveness because you're in deep hurt if you don't. And to take it lightly, again, I go back to this issue in our society. I've got to be careful here how I say this. We seem to be promoting behavior that is self-destructive. It's so, on the face of it, it's self-destructive at the very least. And we're, we're saying, be proud of that. I'm going, what? <laughs> I'm sorry. I can't buy that. You know, it's a tough, tough thing. Well, my brother told me one time, and I thought this was a really flat limb yeah. What he said, and I don't know where he got it. Yeah. But he said, people that sin and continue to sin, they will try to drag you down with them. Uh, because yeah. that gives them, they shelter in numbers. Maybe. And, well, <laughs> uh, yeah, I hear you. That's how they look at that's it. That's how they look at it, sure. If they can get you to do it, I know. then how can you condemn them? Yeah. Or and, and see, my, not, my job is not to condemn it. It's not me who condemns. Right. I just read the stuff here, and it jumps out at it's you. It's like somebody was telling me one time, well, don't you forgive people? I said, I can't forgive somebody. Yeah. There's only one person that can forgive yeah. a person. Yeah. And that ain't me. Yeah. I mean, I can hold no grudge. It's yeah. a little bit different. But I know. I can't forgive. Basically, what we forgive are people that, af that offend us or that do something to violate our rights. You can forgive them when they ask for that. And if they don't, then there's no obligation on your side to forgive. But, huh? There is a term out there now, and I believe it's been since Rome. Yeah, go ahead. Hmm. And I think that they're basically applying it. Mm -hmm. Much of what you see in the Old Testament did not apply to us. Yeah. Now. Right. Yeah. Well, see, the, the point that's is. How, that's how I think a lot of these other denominations. Yeah. 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 
Yeah. Well, I heard an argument about that one time, and it's a discussion concerning age. And there were there was a it was a I was listening to a podcast and these guys were discussing it. And the one guy was one of these progressive Christians. Well, this line with the man isn't a time anymore. And the guy says, Well, what about age? He said, That didn't originate among heterosexuals. Right. That originated among homosexuals. That is a homosexual disease. And he says, God told you. Do not lie with a man. It's an abomination. You don't lie with a beast. That's an abomination. And it's very interesting that monkeypox mm -hmm. is almost exclusively found where? In the homosexual community. But when you go read the warnings about it, you won't see a word about it. Right. Homosexual. Yeah. I know. It's like the whole thing with AIDS was. Well, you can get AIDS. I can't get AIDS except by blood transfusion or having sex with a man. So why do you want to let gay men give blood? And the big drive was to let gay men give blood. And FDA allows it now. Yeah. And that's just another way to drag you into their sin. And another term that's out there is dangerous affiliation. Mm hmm Well, I always draw the thing mm -hmm. from, uh, and I'm trying to remember exactly what it was, when the angels went to visit Lot, and Lot had to protect the two angels, I guess it was angels from the... Yeah, right, the, right, right. Jesus, they thought, felt the that was... in the city because yeah. they wanted to do things with them that... Sure, you know, exactly, and yeah. You're, and you're getting to that point sometimes where you see these, and this is the thing that really gets me, is we don't even force the laws anymore. Why would any, or even parents, why would you allow your six-year-old kid to be taken to a nightclub? I know. And dance with strippers. Whew. Or wow. dance with trans strippers. Yeah, what are they yeah, called yeah. Nowadays? And I'm thinking, wait a minute, isn't that a, first of all, not only is that a moral violation, it's a legal violation because if you're under 21 or yep. 18, you can't be in those places. Exactly. But what's the law do? <laughs> We're not it ignores it. No. Exactly. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of interesting. I, I think we've exhausted. I don't, I don't want to go too far. We're being recorded, guys. Uh, just so you know, we may end up dumping this, rec this recording. Well, you can see why they say you yeah. shouldn't lay with a prostitute. Because yeah. what happens? You end up with diseases. Sure. And there's some of your skin diseases. Yeah, and you know, deeper. I remember reading about how the Navy, you know, you went in for your inspection after being on Liberty for three or four days in port, you had to go be inspected by the medic. Just like the <laughs> priest. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right, all right. And didn't that used to be a court martial offense? Yeah, you're reading government property. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or rendering unfit for service, something like yeah. that. Whatever it was, I remember it used to be a... You could get in real trouble. Speaking of the feasts, okay. yeah. <laughs> let's talk about the feast for a minute. I would appreciate it. Thank you. Um, the feast of the Lord, and it identifies here uh, seven feasts and one fast. I just wanted to go over that uh, briefly. The one is quickly mentioned and dismissed. That's the Sabbath. That's every, every week. We, there's, a, there's a feast, if you will. Because there's a rest day and you are not supposed to be working. You're supposed to be enjoying yourself and your family um, by having a, a nice meal. Then there are two uh, that come at the beginning or early in the year. One is Passover and the other is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So that's one, two, three of the feasts there. Um, and then uh, at harvest time, there is the feast of the first fruits of the harvest. Uh, now, this is interesting because 
my scripture references differ a little bit from this textbook that I had in uh, college when I was at Concordia. And I just want to point out one feast that seems to be missing from this list. Let's see. Uh, yeah, there it is. Um, and that is the, the feast that's shown here. Let's go ahead with this. Uh, so the one, two, three, four. Fourth is the, the feast of the first fruits at the beginning of the harvest season. And then there is the, the feast of weeks. One, two, three, four, five. Feast of weeks. And uh, that's followed by the feast of and the, the Feast of Weeks has also to do with the harvest. Um, and it, it mentions specifically during that, that uh, harvest time that the harvesters are supposed to leave. They're not to harvest everything right up to the edge of their land. They're supposed to leave a good amount of that available for gleaning for the poor to be able to have something to eat. Then there's the Feast of Trumpets. And finally, I'm going to skip over atonement for a moment because it's not a feast. The Feast of Booths, B-O-O-T-H, the Feast of Booths, which is the last feast of the year. Um, the Day of Atonement stands out because it is not intended as a feast. It's a specific sacrifice that is given along with fasting and the term that's used in scripture in my translation is that you shall afflict yourselves. So I'm going to read that little section of Day of Atonement. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Now on the tenth day of the seventh month is the Day of Atonement. It shall be for you a time of holy convocation, and you shall afflict yourselves and present a food offering to the Lord. So they, the, the people are not allowed to eat, but they are to offer a food offering to the Lord. And you shall not do any work on that very day, for it is the day of atonement to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. For whoever is not afflicted on that day shall be cut off from the people. Severe punishment for not afflicting yourself. And then there are several notes in my scripture, and one of them sends me back to the 16th chapter. This is the 23rd, uh, and it talks about self-denial, afflicting yourself means self-denial, including fasting. So that's an interesting thing uh, to note about that. Uh, so then that last feast is, is called the, the Festival of Booths. Now, in the, in the um, book that I, was, that I have that goes through the feast, uh, I see a feast of the tabernacle, but I don't see any feast after that. So apparently all of them are given, and I only see one, two, three. Oh, you know what? Okay, there were three in there. One, two, three, four. I think in the one case... Uh, I know what this one, the difference is. It's in the Feast of the, whew, the Feast of the, ooh, help me out here, um, the Feast of Weeks. Right, that's what I've got. The, the Feast of Weeks, right. Yeah, and I, the, I ha, in here, in here I see Feast of Booths. Well, I've got so, Feast of Weeks. Do you have both of them? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, I was looking weeks. for it in, oh, okay, feast you've got a. Weeks is a holy day. Right, God. right. Then you have the Feast of Trumpets, Day of Atonement, Feast uh -huh. of Booths, the first day Feast of Booths, which is a holy day, and then the closing ceremony of Feast of Booths, but they had all of them listed. Okay, well that's interesting to me because um, it's listed here, but I could not find it in the list that I was reading, uh -huh. so I missed, th I missed that somehow, well, I yeah. but you thank you. Yeah. Uh, rhythm of the uh, uh, harvest. Yeah. And yeah. all the calendar follows the seasons. Right. 
Um, well, thanks a lot for that clarification, because I do appreciate it. I, I was wondering, where the heck is that? <laughs> and I know it's there. I just, I just skipped over it. Okay. Well, I always find interesting was reading in other books that the way that our, my book presented the Passover, it's kind of like, you know, they have a little, they have a thing and they do. But I was reading that there's a lot more involved in it in traditional Jewish families. There's Correct. a lot more to that day yeah. than just eating unleavened bread and right. the rest of that. Well, guess what? I actually attended a, a Jewish Passover. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, but it was with a bunch of GIs. A good friend of mine was Jewish in Vietnam, and um, to accommodate the Jewish faith, just like the Christians, they would have certain holidays and moments where you had a worship service, there'd be a chaplain there and all. Uh, on the Passover, my friend, and believe it or not, his name is Moses, um, in, <laughs> it is, it is. Um, <laughs> he's a good guy, really good. I liked him a lot. Anyway, um, he respected my faith, I respected his. But anyway, we, we had that in downtown Saigon in this huge hotel dining area. And um, it, was, it was led by a rabbi. And everybody, they picked out the people who were supposed to ask the questions and this, that, and the other stuff. And, you know, um, it was a long ceremony. Uh, it, it took pretty much all, the, all day, all the afternoon anyway, afternoon, evening. And um, I noticed that they actually did a whole lot more eating and drinking than you hear about. <laughs> because every time you turn around, you're drinking wine, and you leave there, and you're kind of <laughs> hobbling out. Um, but it was a great experience, I have to admit. And I've been also blessed to be able, and I'm sure a lot of you have too, to have a um, Passover meal in a Christian setting, you know, where it's explained, all the parts of the Passover meal are explained as you're doing it. And I also, we at our, our church in Florida actually had a rabbi do that for us. Um, and he took us through an authentic yeah, they call it Seder. Seder feast. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, the, and uh, that was an interesting experience as well. So I've had it by a rabbi in a Christian church. I've had it by a rabbi in, in, in a Jewish group and by a Christian pastor who was going, walking us through it as well. Um, but I think it's important for us to know that, for one thing, and I think Jim made this reference and other people, uh, we don't give up the, new, the Old Testament just because there's a New Testament. You know, you don't ignore the Old Testament. You, it's part of. And the fulfillment of the whole thing is Christ. Uh, and so it's important to know that. Now, granted, we're not going to take you out and stone you, okay? There's a lot of things that they would have done in those days that we will not do today. Uh, but then again, that's because Christ's sacrifice covers those sins. And we're fortunate that we live in a time of the gospel because it, it obviates, gets rid of, a lot of the necessities that they had in those, in those particular days to keep people straight. By the way, another interesting thing, I didn't even realize this. There's cannibalism in the Bible. Hmm, really? Okay, here it comes. Um, and it occurs in 1 Kings, but let me read um, the passage where they mention it. Uh, this is in chapter 26. Um, and it says, um, okay, this is where people are rejecting God. And, um, and God has words for them, okay? And um, he says, you know, you will listen to what I say. You will do what I say. These are my commandments. I am the Lord. But if you do not follow what I say, here are the consequences. And he says that. It says, um, but if you will not listen to me and will not do all these commandments, if you spurn my statutes and if your soul abhors my rules so that you will not do all my commandments but break my covenant, then I will do this to you. I will visit you with panic, with wasting disease and fever that consume the eyes and make the heart ache. And you shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it. 
I will set my face against you. Remember that, set my face against you? I will set my face against you, and you will be struck down before your enemies. Those who hate you shall rule over you, and you shall flee when none pursues you. And if in spite of this you will not listen to me, then I will discipline you again sevenfold for your sins, and I will break the pride of your power, and I will make your heavens like iron and your earth like bronze, and your strength shall be spent in vain, for your land will, shall not yield its increase, and the trees of the land shall not yield their fruit. Well, let me skip a little bit. Then it says, But in spite of this, if you will not, this is chap, uh, verse 27 of that same chapter, well, listen to me, but walk contrary to me, then I will walk contrary to you in fury, and I myself will discipline you sevenfold for your sins. You shall eat the flesh of your sons. Wow. You shall eat the flesh of your sons, and you shall eat the flesh of your daughters, and I will destroy your high places and cut down your incense altars. Cast your dead bodies upon the dead bodies of your idols, and my soul will abhor you. The two sieges he's talking about, is that the Babylonian? Kingdom? This is, um, it's um, King, First Kings. I know, the reference? The Babylonian siege, or, or is that actually? I'm sorry, are you talking about right here? Um, there, there was a, well, the, the, the one that they're speaking of here that I understand, at least they made a cross-reference to, is the siege of the Syrians. It was a Syrian king. And, 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 a, um, um, and is a, a king of Israel, or chief, you know, commander-in-chief or whatever, was in, in that battle. And, and he goes by the wall. Uh, let me see if I can find that. Oof, I, I, I didn't write it down. I know it's First Kings. Um, I don't know. I kind of look at this. The, the title of content of this is easy. So oh, yeah. he's saying you're not going to be able to grow any food, so I'm thinking, well, what are you going to do? I mean, yeah, know, exactly. That's what's going to happen. Right. We're not obeying. Is that paragraph showing that you won't have food? No. 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 It's, uh, what it's saying is I'm going to make you as evil as you can possibly be. And you're not going to be happy about it. But I was going to read this, um, and I didn't mark, I didn't put my bookmark in. I did underline it so I can find it. Okay, first king. Let me, let me go through this. Oh, you know what? I have it marked here. Um, here it is. Oh, that's Jeremiah. Um, hmm, hmm, hmm. Sorry, guys. Well, Jeremiah was the Babylonian. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm speaking of the something Syrians else. The Syrians would have been before that, right? Correct. The Syrians would certainly be before that. Um, well, I took all this to mean that. Me, all right, that go ahead. Be so desperate to yeah, that's correct. What it was? The siege. Eat. It was a siege, and it was a Syrian king, and uh, the woman. It's a terribly sad story. Oh, my goodness. Um, they were starving. And the one mother, oh, jeez. Uh, the one mother is told by the other mother, we're starving. Let's kill your child and eat him, and then we'll kill my child. And so they kill the first child, boil him, they eat him. And then the second mother reneges and hides her child. <laughs> Here it is. Um, you know, with very oh, yeah. That used to be Christian. Oh, this is Elisha. Yeah. Sorry. A lot of false idols around. There's nothing to say God isn't going to be angry about it. He's not going to discipline. Yeah. Here it is. No, no, of course not. He says, I'm going to make you do it. Listen carefully. I'll read it to you. Okay, here. This is in 1 Kings, or 2 Kings. 2 Kings 6, verses 28. Um, well, actually, I'll start at the beginning of that. 
After, afterward, Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, mustered his entire army and went up and besieged Samaria. And there was a great famine in Samaria as they besieged it until a donkey's head was sold for 80 shekels of silver and a fourth part of a cab of doves dung for five shekels in, of silver. Now as the king of Israel was passing by the wall, on the wall, on the wall, a woman cried out to him saying, help my lord, O king. And he said, if the Lord will not help you, how, how shall I help you? From the threshing floor or from the wine press? And the king asked her, uh, yeah, and the king asked her, what is your trouble? She answered, this woman said to me, give your son that we may eat him today and we will eat my son tomorrow. So we boiled my son and ate him. And on the next day, I said to her, give your son that we may eat him. But she had hidden her son. When the king heard these words of the woman, he tore his clothes. Now he was passing by on the wall, and the people looked, and behold, he had sackcloth uh, beneath his body, beneath on his body. And he said, May God do so to me, and more so, if the head of Elisha, the son of Shabbath, remains on his shoulders today. Whoa, he's going after Elisha. Hmm. Um, but the point is, there's the, the, the text that talks about cannibalism. Not that, that he was advising it, but that people would be so completely devoid of faith in God that they would themselves commit that awful thing. And um, I was pretty much shocked by it. Um, I just can't imagine, um, you know, but it, it can happen. I read the Donner Party, by the way. Well, there's, been, <laughs> there's been numerous instances over the years where people, somebody's died. Oh, I'm saying, I read the Donner Party. The, the, the most famous, the most famous is the Donner Party out in, out in Lake Tahoe. One of the, about the, uh, the Moby Dick was based on. Yeah. The uh, whaling ship. Yeah. Because those guys ate several of their members just died. Yeah. They said now, they said they didn't kill anybody. They died naturally. Oh, yeah. And then they, well, that's the same with the Donner Party. They weren't killing them on purpose. They, they died, too, from starvation. And so the people that survived ate some of their bodies. Um, well, let's see. We're coming up on our, the end. I just want to. What happened to that princess? Oh, yeah. The, she had the, the uh, soccer player. Yeah, the soccer team. Yeah. Andy. Yeah, yeah. I remember hearing about that one, too. Um, so there's, and that the. You got Hannibal Lecter. <laughs> <laughs> I never watched Hannibal either, so. Um, Oh, you know, we're talking about, you know, would, they, would God ever suggest that they do it? And my answer is no. Um, and at the end of all of this, when he says, you will do this, you will do that, you will do that because you have abandoned me, he says, but, and he ends chapter 26 this way. Uh, this is at, chap at uh, verse 40-something. Um, let's see, 40, I guess, 40. But if they confess their iniquity, and the iniquity of their fathers in their treachery that they committed against me, and also in walking contrary to me, so that I walked contrary to them and brought them into the land of their enemies. If then their uncircumcised heart, this is a good use of the word uncircumcised, then their uncircumcised heart is humbled, and they make amends for their iniquity, then I will remember my covenant with Jacob, and I will remember my covenant with Isaac, and my covenant with Abraham, and I will remember the land. But the land shall be abandoned by them, and enjoy its, its Sabbath while it lies desolate without them, and they shall make amends for their iniquity, because they spurned my rules, and their soul uh, abhorred my statutes. Yet, for all that, when they are in the land of their enemies, I will not spurn them, neither will I abhor them as to destroy them utterly and break my covenant with them, for I am the Lord their God. But I will, for their sake, remember the covenant with the forefathers whom I brought out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the nations, uh, that I might be their God. I am the Lord. Um, 
you know, that, that's pretty desperate. When he's, also, he's also foretelling. Because one of the things oh, yeah. we well, we, the Israelites. We, we are they, we're living that, are, yeah. They are so in uh, Exodus, they're told to remember mm -hmm. and to be gratified. Right. It's all for gratitude mm -hmm. to God for saving them from Egypt. Right. But it's only in a couple days. And they turn. They, they turn. I know. And he's, and he's telling them again here. All the way through here, it tells them. Your human nature is going to turn you against yeah. me, and I am going to stick it to you. Yep. You and will suffer I, the consequence. You will but, suffer the consequence. But I will not forget you in yeah. the long run. Yeah, correct. And that's why the Lord, that's why Christ. And that's where the blood. Yeah. His blood for the it, exactly. His mercy. Uh, I think that's an important concept here. Um, that when you finally are able to confess and turn your heart toward God, he will turn his heart toward you. He has mercy. Um, well, one of the things that I find interesting about all this stuff we yeah. talk about, and we talk about how Christ came and your sins were forgiven, etc., in the New Testament. But you know what I notice is people that refuse to believe in God, mm -hmm. Or refuse to follow God's teaching. Yeah. End up committing wholesale evil. Yeah. On their own. Yeah. Because they turned totally away from God. Mm hmm And they had no moral guidance. That's an important word right there, moral. Yeah. Because the morality is written in our hearts. Well, we he don't said. Have any morality. But uh, uh, but I'm just saying, God said He would write the law in our hearts. And when you deny that, that's your blasphemy to me. Yeah. Uh, that's the blasphemy. Uh, because. But when you talk about why we hear so much evil in the world, yeah. you know, people killing people, yeah. beating them, or people yeah. killing children, and, and yeah. doing things that you And you wonder, well, how can you do that? Well, it's really easy to know why. Yeah. Because they turned to evil. <coughs> right. And totally rejected God. They have no curb. They got, they got no. They got no curb to guide them. That's they my point. Yeah, the they're ball. they're all <laughs> over the place. I know. <laughs> oh my. Well, anyway, having said that, there was one thing that I read that I, has really disturbed me, and I don't have an answer for it at all, and that is uh, at the end of chapter 28, uh, 27, 27, the end of Leviticus. It says, um, and if he who dedicates the field, this is, has to do with land, but, but I, it goes on. Uh, uh, he who uh, dedicates the field wishes to redeem it. Oh, this is if you are going to dedicate part of your land to the Lord, give it up, make it holy so it's the Lord's. Um, if you want to redeem it, then, um, and you've sold the field to another man, it shall not be redeemed anymore. But if the field, when it is released in the Jubilee, and oh, by the way, we missed about the Sabbath of years. There's a Sabbath year, and then there's a Jubilee year. Every seven years, there's a Sabbath year. And every 50 years, every 49 years, actually 50, every 50 years, there's a Jubilee year uh, where everybody returns to his own home. Any deals that you made, any selling of a person that you did is negated, is completely washed away. That person becomes a free person. Again, you can actually sell yourself into slavery in their, in their culture. Um, but on the Jubilee year, that person can be uh, released and go back to his family. Uh, there are some other things in there that I, I, we, we don't have time to get into tonight that cannot be redeemed, but there are very few. Very few things that won't return uh, ownership to a man. But this is the thing that disturbed me. It says... But the field, uh, when it is released um, in the Jubilee, shall be a holy gift to the Lord like a field that has been devoted. The priest shall be in possession of it. If he dedicates it to the Lord, uh, uh, the, a field that he has bought, which is not part of his possession, then the priest shall calculate the amount. Well, let's go on because I, uh, the word devoted is what got my attention. So I read on, I read on. Uh, down in verse 28, it says, But no devoted thing 
that a man devotes to the Lord of anything he has. Now listen to this. Whether man or beast or of his inherited field shall be sold or redeemed. Every devoted thing is most holy to the Lord. No one devoted who, has, who is to be devoted for destruction for mankind shall be ransomed. He shall surely be put to death. So you can actually have a man that you own. Don't ask me how. Like a slave? I don't know. That you can devote to destruction. And he will be killed. He will die. That's hard words. I threw it out beside it. Those are hard words. Um, I just don't know how to take that. Uh, look down below, verse 28. Um, well, I'm mindful of saying this. Huh? No devoted thing that a man devotes to the Lord. There's, my thing says firstborn animals already belong to God. We know that. And you can redeem a child. But this is a person, a person, not an animal, no. devoted to destruction. And it uses the pronoun he. By the way, properly <laughs> used pronoun. Uh, he shall surely be put to death. That that is disturbing. That's that's all I can say. Yeah, I, have, I have a note here. Says, Go ahead. Devoted to destruction were usually the captives in the wars. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Isn't that interesting? So it's a, it's a prisoner of war. Is their explanation there? Um, and I have not, none in my Bible. I don't have any explanation for it at all. Yeah, mine doesn't change. Yeah, yeah. It just said about the firstborn animal. Exactly, and they are to be. And I just read the saying where the, you go to the rabbi and say. Correct for your uh, child. You you have to. It's like yeah. For your firstborn son. Correct, <laughs> and I'm one of those firstborn sons, but I wasn't Jewish, so I'm good. Yeah. But the point is, um, you could, and every place else I've read, you can redeem a child. However, this is a person that's dedicated to or whatever you call it, devoted. They call the word, and so it's a different use of the word devoted from what I've ever understood. I'll tell you what, uh, Michael, when you get in there, I did want to read one psalm, okay? I'm going to go ahead. One thing you didn't, you, that I thought was interesting. What? How many times I've heard people say the uh, people flee when, the wicked flee when no one pursues. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And there it is right there in the in the in in God's word, you know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I, no wonder I'm so familiar with it. <laughs> you and those who hate you shall roll over, and you shall flee when none pursues you. Sure, sure. Uh, what I'd like to read is Psalm 85. Is connected with um, the study we're doing tonight. Uh, it was number six, I think, in our um, our readings. Uh, that has to do with chapters 23 and 24. But I'd like to read this because I love the image here. And I just wrote, wrote, I read, wrote my prayer to be aligned with that. But here it is. Lord, this is Psalm 85. It's um, to the choir master, Psalm of the Sons of Korah. Lord, you were favorable to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people. You covered all their sin. You withdrew all your wrath. You turned from your hot anger. Restore us again, O God, of our salvation, and put away your indignation toward us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your steadfast love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people, to his saints. But let them not turn back to folly. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him. That glory may dwell in our land. Now here's the beautiful lines. Steadfast love and faithfulness meet. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Faithfulness springs from up from the ground and righteousness looks down from the sky. 
Yes, the Lord will give you what is good, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him and make his footsteps away. I love the image of the faithful being the people and the righteous being God, and they meet and kiss. That is so nifty. That's a beautiful image. Who were the sons of Korah? They were somebody in Israel. You know, uh, a lot of these are sons of Korah psalms. Um, in fact, David, f from what I call, recall, David ends his psalms around 46, at least so it says. Uh, it says the last song, psalm of David. And then we have psalm, psalms by Solomon, and we have psalms by others, uh, and Korah is one of the big names that pops up for a lot of the psalms that aren't David's or aren't Solomon's. Yeah, I see that a lot. Yeah, um, it's interesting reading the, uh, the notes involving 85. Yeah. Because it had to do with being the people returning from the exile in Babylon and finding how hard it was going to be to rebuild. Yeah, Israel. Jerusalem. Yeah, absolutely. And there was quite a discussion about rebuilding Jerusalem. Sure, sure. Um, and we see, uh, we saw, we will get into that. We'll, we'll be. Did the Babylonians destroy Jerusalem like the Romans did? Yeah, they did, pretty much. I was going to pray before we finished here, if I may, um, and then we'll stop our recording, okay? So let's just close with uh, the Lord's Prayer, okay? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And this ends our session tonight. Thank you, gentlemen. I'm so sorry.